This month, March 2024, is the 40th anniversary celebration for CFUV, the campus radio station here uh, in Greater Victoria. Um, and they are celebrating that anniversary. They're also doing their annual funding drive um, to kind of seek donations from the community to help them keep it going for hopefully another 40 years. And today we have with us one of the hosts um, on CFUV, Kobe Andrews. How are you? Doing good. How are you today, Cam? I'm quite good, and I'm excited to have you here. Uh, and you're uh, maybe you can give me some tips because you're you're uh, a pro certainly at uh, at talking on the radio, at hosting. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about your show. Yeah, absolutely. So the show that I started, Hot Local Singles in Your Playlist, I began about a year and a half ago in November. Um, I had a bit of time off work, and I really wanted to get involved in something that I was passionate about. And community radio was something that always kind of spoke truly to me, just based on the people that I was in community with. So I started the show Hot Local Singles in your playlist as a way of kind of giving myself a platform to help elevate and promote other artists in town, especially a lot of folks that I really had, you know, loved seeing in the music scene, um, and especially to kind of help other people have informed engagement when they're showing up in these spaces and engaging with these acts. Yeah, so what, Hot Local Singles, it's the newest singles, it's the hottest new music from, you know, not the, the biggest artists in the world, mm -hmm. but artists that are doing interesting things in our community. And I think that as there become fewer venues, fewer all ages mm -hmm. venues, um, it, it, it takes on an extra importance to have that mm -hmm. outlet of a mm -hmm. station where people can discover this type of music. So how do you kind of go about, um, you know, finding artists mm -hmm. for that platform, uh, kind of picking who gets on the show and then, um, just putting the whole thing together. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, starting the show in 2020, kind of riding out the end of a lot more COVID restrictions and whatnot, um, seeing live music consistently was definitely difficult. Um, but that's a large part of how I really find new bands and engage with acts now is definitely seeing them live in Victoria. Um, but coming with that and coming, you know, being more entrenched within the community has really helped me to, you know, hear about things happening through other friends like, you know, maybe there's these shows happening that wouldn't get posted around or I might not know people in that community, but people know to refer me to those kind of shows thinking like, you know, either he'll like it, he won't like it. Either way, he's going to come out and he'll support these shows. Um, another big part being that through CFUV and all Canadian uh, campus community radio stations, we have weekly charts that come out mm -hmm. um, and anyone can find those on, I believe it's Earshot Online. Um, but, you know, through CFUV as a volunteer member, we get special access to those to see every week what is being submitted to CFUV, what's being accepted and put onto our charts. And thankfully for me, um, CFUV has a category where you can filter out through local artists. So that kind of gives me a huge shortcut in having, you know, a database that goes back uh, whenever they started the database, not 40 years, but definitely a long time, yeah. to be able to go through there and just filter through any local artists. Um, and then you also have people like Troy Lemberg, who is the music director at CFUV, who also organizes shows in Victoria, um, and people that just have, you know, both institutional knowledge from working at CFUV for so long, but also that um, community knowledge that's passed down uh, there's like so many bands, like one of her friends, Jeffrey, who used to play in a band called uh, PPPD that I never knew about. But when it was Black History Month, I was like, hey, Troy, um, are there some more local black artists that I could play on the show? And he's like, oh, yeah, this, 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 and this, all off the top of his head. Yeah. So I think that historical knowledge from other people in the community plays a really important part of learning about bands past and current in Victoria. Yeah, and I mean, Troy's been doing it for, for quite a bit. He's oh, yeah. been kind of a, such a central figure oh, better in Victoria a, music. A pillar of community, to say the least. Yeah, and, and um, but you're also talking about, so there's the knowledge in the station, who, people who know the scene have been in here a long time, but you also, by having that mm -hmm. position, become kind of a conduit for mm -hmm. um, people know that, okay, this is where I, I send it into. Exactly. This is the person that I want to hear about so-and-so's band, about mm -hmm. my friend's band, um, in addition to, as you say, these, these kind of charts for mm -hmm. different campus stations in Canada, what's doing well within the station, what's doing well. Um, yeah, how does that um, shape what goes on the show, shape your own mm -hmm. knowledge, um, you know, those charts of, of what's being mm -hmm. played around the station and, and around the country? Yeah, I mean, you know, as you said, being a conduit to that, 
um, it, it's something that's huge for me to be recognized by other people in the community for that. So there are a lot of, you know, word of mouth referrals, just meeting people within community um, where it becomes a very like serendipitous, just kind of natural thing in meeting these people. Um, I think a big thing about why some people approach me rather than going to CFUV directly, and there are a lot that approach CFUV directly, but also a lot that approach me because Oops, sorry. Um, a lot that approached me because, um, you know, it, it seems like institutions in Victoria within the music community are often more difficult to access. Um, so I think I'm doing part in demystifying saying like, hey, no, like we want you to come in and play on the, sh mm, on the station. Yeah. I want you to come in and play on my show. We want to support you. When we support you, we're supporting our like organizational objective. Yeah. Um, so, you know, being a conduit and being in community with a lot of these people like that, um, I've been able to bring a lot of my friends that play music onto my show. And if there's someone that intrigues me, like someone that is, you know, def definitely a lot of folks from marginalized and underrepresented communities, they are people that for me definitely take priority in bringing them onto my show. And there was, um, his name is Poncho. Uh, he lives up in Saanich and he moved out here about two years ago. Um, I believe he was from Ghana and he, yeah, he moved out here a few years ago and he didn't really have that many connections to the music community at first. I mean, he definitely had some and was established as an artist, um, but some of those more formal connections he didn't really have as much. So when I, when I just, we started following each other at first, I saw that he made music and I'm like, wow, like a black person from Africa making, you know, high life, Afrobeat. Phenomenal varieties of music that don't so we get don't get here very much. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, especially coming from the community too, where yeah. it's you know being represented in a genuine way, where it's like people grew up with this. They they it's the music that they hear like in their homes growing up and everything. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an absolute privilege when I get to highlight artists like that and be able to work with them to bring them on my show because you know it serves the purpose of both exposing them to a larger audience and la allowing more people to engage with them and me doing what I want to do, which is promoting people, helping people, and uh, kind of as much as I can adding to that community fabric. Yeah, and I think that um, the kind of auditory community fabric that mm -hmm. um, these campus radio stations, community radio stations uh, begin to weave mm -hmm. is maybe less so today than in the past, but certainly still mm -hmm. um, a big part of, I think, forming that um, imagined community or felt community mm -hmm. for people all across the region you know there's folks like us that are are often going to shows and these kinds of things but you know especially when you talk about different types of uh of diasporic music mm -hmm. uh you know there's people immigrating from all over the place especially to the west shore mm -hmm. um who don't necessarily have a ton of you know uh, uh in a bigger city where you have kind of these mm -hmm. enclaves yeah. of, of people from your same country um, but there's more and more people from more and more parts of the world starting mm -hmm. to be present here in Victoria. And so I think that there's, uh, that can form a way, you know, there's obviously community organizations and stuff as well. Um, but I remember, you know, me and my dad, for instance, mm -hmm. back in Kelowna, we didn't really have as much of a community radio station there, but in Vancouver, I think it was probably CFRO at the time, mm -hmm. they would have all these different types of, um, you know, just people would come on play the music they liked, play the music from their background. Mm -hmm. And there was a soca night, I think it was Sunday or Saturday. And so it was one of the only times we got to hear Caribbean music for like a full block. Yeah. And so we would put that on every, I think it was the Saturday or the Sunday night. Mm -hmm. And especially me growing up in kind of the interior of BC, mm -hmm. it was my chance to kind of get a bit of a connection yeah, to absolutely. the Caribbean. And so I think because it kind of goes out over the airwaves, mm -hmm. you know, obviously people uh, are into podcasts so they have that kind of parasocial aspect where you feel like you're talking to your friends. I think that that's maybe true mm -hmm. with, um, with radio programming when it can kind mm -hmm. of unify a community and speak to a particular community yeah, and absolutely. also help communities discover each other. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I've droned on about it, but I want to hear you as mm -hmm. someone from within it talk about what you think the value of community radio broadly mm -hmm. is. Yeah, I think the, the broad value of it really is that it does, you know, like you were saying, it, it brings this very fragmented, very disaggregated uh, communities and diasporas together. And it lets you know that there is a presence here. When it's being transmitted, transmitted from CFUV, it's like, you don't know if it's coming from, or sorry, 
when it's being transmitted from CFUV, you know that it's coming from this one station, coming up from campus, that there's people in the city here that are playing this music, there's live musicians coming on the station, you know that they're either passing through the city or living in the city. Um, and you know, especially when it comes to things like Eventide over the summer, which is a series of live music shows every Wednesday, mm -hmm. um, I believe July, yeah, through July and August, it really gives people the opportunity to have that space where they come together. And I think having those events and those in-person functions really creates that space. Whereas, you know, otherwise, like you see a couple friends circumstantially at different shows and spaces here and there. But when you have something that's happening consistently and free and easy to access with a wide variety of different diasporic music shared and different like cultures and scenes of Victoria being represented and celebrated, you just have these spaces that are so easy to build congruence and build a community. And especially being so consistent too, like I went to every single event I'd show, I believe there was eight of them in total, and I could probably list off about 40 or 50 people I also saw at every single one. And so to me, that is so representative of what CFUV does in providing a consistent and stable base to bring people together, whether it's through music, through thoughts and ideas, through spoken word productions like podcasts and whatnot, it just creates space for a congruence of ideas to really take physical space together. Yeah, because this because CFUV as the station kind of oversees uh, these Wednesday events that are then curated by mm -hmm. different people for each date or different organizations mm -hmm. and will have a theme like there's a punk mm -hmm. uh, eventide that draws mm -hmm. must be 500 people. Yeah. Because the or, or the metal one as well. Yeah. The cavity metal curiosities. One especially. Yeah. Yeah. Cavity curiosity shops uh, curation of those kind of metal, hardcore experimental nights is infamous. Um, and then last year we also saw Kemi Craig, who is currently the City of Victoria's mm -hmm. artist in residence yeah. too, um, organizing and curating a, you know, Afrofuturism oriented event. Mm -hmm. That which was really is cool. Yeah. Another, like, another great and phenomenal space to bring, you know, those diasporic events together. You know, different folks of, you know, African heritage from different parts of the continent were able to just share within similar elements of culture and art together. It was really beautiful in that space. Yeah, I think that there's a kind of a, a way that, that these events, um, by being stitched together, connect a bunch of these different mm -hmm. communities, a bunch of these different organizations. For instance, you've got the, uh, the one that's the fundraiser mm -hmm. or part of the fundraising efforts for Girls Rock Camp, mm -hmm. and then which is a, a camp in town where uh, they kind of bring in these kids to learn different instruments and kind of a fun mm -hmm. space. There isn't kind of this kind of masculine rock thing that can maybe intimidate. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. you know, youngsters, and it just kind of brings them into being comfortable with music. Mm -hmm. And then so a lot of people that maybe attended that program when they mm -hmm. were young or that volunteer and teach at it, um, put on mm -hmm. typically once a year, the, one of the Eventide shows. And then you kind of have all these different curators mm -hmm. bringing these different kinds of music. But like you say, there's a lot of people that go to each event mm -hmm. and that's a way that they kind of get a little taste of all these different styles of music and maybe get connected with all these different, uh, organizations mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think people that have attended it as fans or played it as bands um, you know often stick with I, I remember Freak Heat Waves mm -hmm. after they got big I think even after they were in Montreal mm -hmm. came back here and, and did an Eventide show yeah. Diamond Cafe who's I believe most of the time in LA these days mm -hmm. came and did a, a, an Eventide show mm -hmm. last summer um, talk a little bit more about Eventide did you first start hearing about it as a, as a fan when you were involved in the station? Uh, what's that connection between the radio and the live music sides of it? Well, I forget entirely when I started going. Um, I know definitely before COVID, there was a couple of them that I had gone to. Um, I think the one that I most distinctly remember was in, not last year, but the year before in 2022 with one of the finale shows on top of the Yates Street Parquet. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, gorgeous sunset, sunset yeah. four like incredible bands playing, two of them local, one from Vancouver and the Sister Ray from Toronto, I believe. Um, that was the show that Haley Blaze headlined and you know, you had just several hundred people out there soaking up just a blissful summer evening. Um, whether they, they were there for community or for music or just for straight up social reasons, it didn't matter because we all got to share that space and that moment in time together. Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, people, I 
it must have been a couple weeks ago, I mm -hmm. was talking to people and they were bringing, oh, remember the Eventide on mm -hmm. the parquet? Oh, was it this one mm -hmm. with, uh, I think, Black Belt Eagle Scout might have played? Oh, my goodness. Or no, it wasn't yeah. the one the other year? And then talking about just times they'd spent, the people they were with at the mm -hmm. time, certain songs that they'd heard played. I mean, it really is such a kind of um, quintessential part of the summer for a lot mm -hmm. of people that I think are in or are adjacent to the music scene, mm -hmm. at least in kind of central oh, absolutely. Uh, Victoria area. Yeah, um, it's, um, it's formed some core memories for me, for sure. And, you know, I've said to some friends in the past, but the more I think about it, the more it rings true that... You know, people are just like, oh, like, you're a really big music person. And I'm like, well, like, not actually. Like, I actually don't know the history or, like, you know, definitions of many genres. I'm much more of a community person. And music in Victoria, especially the music scene in Victoria, has been my avenue to community. And it's some of the spaces that I felt the most seen, the most supported, the most loved. Just having the most fun, the most energetic, the most... Um, yeah, the spaces that just have the most, like, uh, just that lively energy of people that are doing things together. Um, but yeah, that, I think that speaks true to CFUV is that I found it through community, hmm. which feels really appropriate with the way that I'm showing up in spaces like Eventide, the way I'm showing up with my radio show and getting to have people in the community come on, and just the way that I'm getting to meet and share space and time with people. It, to me, it all comes back around to community. Um, don't get me wrong, I do absolutely love the local music scene. I love the music I play in the show. I love learning more about music, but I think at its core, it's all rooted in community for me. Yeah, there's a reason it's a local music show for you and not just absolutely. any kind of music that you like. Um, mm -hmm. But as you talk about community, these memories that people have from you know, particular gatherings for music, mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of darker side of that is that mm -hmm. Um, there are fewer and fewer, it seems, these days, yeah. places where you can come and gather that way. There are mm -hmm. fewer official events. There are fewer basement shows, in particular house shows, yeah. as kind of things get more expensive. Some mm -hmm. of the kind of older uh, houses with, with extra space that mm -hmm. people got to use are getting renovated or mm -hmm. people are getting booted out of them yeah. um, as they get flipped or rented or whatever it may be. Um, how, how do you kind of think that people are going to find ways to have these types of experiences mm -hmm. with music and with gathering together at a time when people are busy, things cost more, mm -hmm. and there are fewer and fewer places to do it. Well, I think one of the biggest things to me in Victoria, and, and I say this with affection, but when you look to the punk, the hardcore, the DIY community music scenes, um, affectionately I refer to them as cockroaches because no matter how much you want to get rid of them, no matter how much people don't like them, they will always be around mm. in every basement and every corner, every nook and cranny. And I think that's something that I appreciate about the hardcore scene and yes. the do-it-yourself community so much is that if there is space, even if it's difficult to access, even if it's towing the line of being legal or not, <laughs> even if it's, you know, somewhere where they're going to, you know, maybe only be able to do it once, they will find a way to put shows on and make music happen. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've seen is more use of uh, various community spaces, such as like the community centers, especially Oakland's um, Fernwood, Fernwood Community yeah. Center, as well as uh, Little Fernwood, which is the Fernwood Gallery. Mm -hmm. um, you know, using those spaces that are thankfully cheaper and more accessible, but then those come with navigating the you know people that have the not in my backyard kind of attitudes and mentalities. Um, with losing formal venue spaces as well too, and informal ones too that are, you know, like established spaces but still share that DIY roots um, for folks that know like of the Layaway or Voyage Fantastique. Um, those are two semi-formal DIY like music spaces that unfortunately we lost in the last three months. Mm -hmm. um, we also lost Herman's Upstairs, which fortunately there is news that the city of Victoria has purchased that space with it being in their strategy to support music, the local community scene, and to keep public arts like that, public art spaces available like that. Yeah, there's some hope that something will will return to it soon. Mm -hmm. But this is, of course, all on top of mm -hmm. losing Logan's, mm -hmm. a very popular kind of um, kind of dive bar that mm -hmm. hosted a lot of music for many years. Mm -hmm. Copper Owl, a really cool um, mm -hmm. kind of retro space that had a kind of a pit where people would go and play music. Uh, Subculture Club mm -hmm. up in the Rock Bay area. Um, Carlton Club, which yeah. was in a, a 
got a chance to be a space mm -hmm. uh, and replace some of these older venues as a kind of accessible uh, space for music and all ages shows and that kind of thing because it was in a building that was to be destroyed. Yeah. But by the, by the same token that this building was old and about to be redeveloped, it, it, um, its lifespan was cut short early because mm -hmm. the building was physically cracking. Yeah. And so that was, I think, must have been two years ago now. And so that was kind of an, it seems like um, there are a lot of, as you get fewer and fewer of these established mm -hmm. spaces, you make do where you can. Mm -hmm. And whether for physical reasons like that or simply logistical reasons, uh, it's harder to count on those lasting more than mm -hmm. half a year, a few months, potentially. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you have those kind of very, um, you know, the spaces that exist for a short or maybe medium, but like unstable amount of time and not knowing how long they can operate, you know, there's only so much that people are willing to put into those spaces. Um, like there is the, the lower block of Pandora where businesses operate, um, Habit Coffee and Dumbling Drop are a couple that I have in mm -hmm. mind, yeah. but every two years that block goes up. And there is, I believe it's a question posed to council or to some city folks saying, you know, are we going to allow for this block to be redeveloped? So there's infrastructure changes that people in those buildings, in those businesses that some have been around, you know, 17 plus years, some of those infrastructure that they're not going to bother spending money on because it's like, well, I need to wait to find out if I'm going to be out of here in the next two years or whether it's mm. worth putting the money in for this. Yeah. And so the same goes with these venues too. Um, and, you know, you have established places like the Wicked Hall, Upstairs Cabaret, Lucky Bar, and a couple others around uh, Capital Ballroom as well, too, that are, you know, notorious for being pillars of, you know, parts of the music community there. There are establishments that have been around for a long time. They have, you know, regular events that seem like they are very well, like, financially supported through those. And, you know, they're on good working terms with the city and whatnot. So you have those spaces where you can regularly and consistently go see shows, both local acts, touring acts, um, yeah, and various performances. But having that established presence through those venues becomes an issue of access. Um, for there's my, only so many slots. Exactly, yeah. There's only so many days per week where you know, it's going to be viable to throw an event. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember the first show that I organized last year um, we had the headlining artist quarterback who used to perform uh, locally as an artist, uh, but now lives off in Toronto. Mm -hmm, yeah. And so, you know, I was paying um, everything, you know, artist fees, venue fee, everything in total. You know, it was probably like looking at four to five thousand dollars to produce the show. And that was the first show that I organized. And I'm very thankful that it was well attended and well received and was fortunately in the positive. But there's a lot of spaces where people try organizing their first show and because it's kind of hard to organize shows when there's barriers to accessing these spaces, um, you don't know how those are going to be received, how much of a following is going to turn into an actual audience at your show. Yeah, it's higher stakes potentially than mm -hmm. you would maybe want that ladder to be or that staircase yeah. to be of kind of Absolutely. there's a pure backyard show, mm -hmm. there's... Uh, kind of a step up from that, mm -hmm. a, a basement show, a house show, uh, a, a kind of quasi-official show, mm -hmm. and then a few steps in between there. But mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of those middle steps are gone. And so it becomes yeah. a, a bit of a riskier proposition mm -hmm. to try and think, okay, will this show have draw in one of these larger, mm -hmm. more expensive, higher stakes venues? Absolutely. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like is there an incentive structure there where you maybe lean more towards a more established act because you have to be certain that they'll have the pull? Definitely, yeah. Um, you know, we promoters, organizers, we rely heavily on the artist having appeal um, to bring people into these events, into these shows, to sell tickets, to make sure that we're not going out of pocket. Um, there's people that do it a lot of different ways, but personally, I will guarantee artists and I will go out of pocket if I have to. I don't think that an artist should have to go out of pocket because of you know, me who is a professional middleman in this sense, hmm. being port organizing an event or whatnot. So if I'm relying on their draw to bring people in, I'm going to make sure that they're taken care of. But also there's, you know, certain people that have built up such platforms for themselves where they can bring absolutely unknown artists in 
and still pack a place out because mm. they've built a platform where people see their reputation and rely on that. Mm. And yeah. I'm very fortunate with being close to different parts of the community in Victoria that people have come to trust me as an organizer and the people that I work with. So when I can you know, be really pushy and tell people that they're gonna love this show even <laughs> if they don't know this artist and they trust me, then I get to follow up on that trust and deliver an experience that they didn't know they were gonna get. Yeah, and it's always kind of this balance between giving people what they came for, what mm -hmm. they're asking for, but also continuing to put them into that process of mm -hmm. discovering new music as with on the show. So I want to ask you mm -hmm. for a moment here, um, what are some of the local artists that you've been seeing mm -hmm. really start to come up lately that you've, you've found people really receptive to? Mm -hmm. um, and who, who are you kind of scanning for? Who are you looking for? And who mm -hmm. should people look out for? You know, it's always interesting because there, it sometimes just feels like the scene out here is fragmented in a few different ways. Um, definitely by group genres such as the hardcore, metal, punk scene. And then you have like the UVic, like the kind of the students and uh, yeah, UVic and Camosun students like associated with different bands um, that you don't often see outside of those student spaces. Yeah. So when you have like Felicitas, like Battle of the Bands up at the Campus Pub, yeah. that's a very different segment of the artists that you're going to be consistently playing downtown. And then you have, you know, people that are in the kind of more like indie mainstream where they're known locally and they have good audience uh, reception. They've, you know, been within the community and know people very well. But sometimes it feels like there's a different uh, kind of segmentation about that. Um, some of the folks that I'm really familiar with, um, there is one of my favorites that I'll always love and I'm really, really grateful that she's recording uh, more music with her band uh, pretty soon here. Um, her, she's actually going to be headlining the show tomorrow night as well at Vinyl Envy. Um, her name's Nilu. Mm -hmm. um, just her vocal stylings, her singing, incredible, or her music is just so heartfelt and... Um, you know, there's, there's other adjacent things of Victoria, but it feels very much unto itself to me. Um, yeah, Nilu is an artist that I've just, the sound, the everything I've been infatuated with since I first saw them all perform together. Um, there's other local arrangements such as Neighborly, which is a mix of psych, pop, funk, and a bit of punk in there as well too with their latest EP. Um, Oh, who else do we have? Uh, a friend of ours as well, Jeffrey, uh, performs under the name Pessoa as well. Um, another yeah. one of those. Really interesting just... stuff that Jeff does, incorporating West oh, African instruments. Yeah, both the Kologo and then a PBC flute, as well as, you know, ambient electronic music that takes a lot of uh, samples from nature, bird sounds, trickling water and whatnot, and then combines it with, yeah, that like West African influence music and those traditional instruments. It just Again, it's one of those areas where you get to bring this diasporic influence into Victoria that has a very unique pathway, and it's something that you're not going to find anything else like here. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a big part of it is, is part of it is kind of showcasing the kind of what's new, what's hot, mm -hmm. and then also I think um, a lot of what you try to do is kind mm -hmm. of show people all these different areas because as you mm -hmm. say, um, it's a scene that has a lot of different sides to it, both yeah. in terms of where it's situated, whether it's downtown, whether it's campus, mm -hmm. but also, you know, there's kind of the punk side, there's the hardcore mm -hmm. side, there's the, um, you know, the, the soft rock side, the indie rock side. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of overlap between the audiences, I yeah. think more than, than many places because it's maybe a medium sized enough place for that. Mm -hmm. And I think because a lot of people have just kind of come into this culture of just mm -hmm. going to shows, liking music, yeah. trying out different types of music. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people are much more willing to, you know, attend with open interest shows that have these very mixed bills. Um, there was one show that I remember going to that kind of stands in my mind as the like key example of this, uh, where it had Neighborly playing, you know, their psych, funk, uh, indie rock, uh, punk kind of mix. And then you have uh, Hillsboro playing their kind of emo alternative rock. Yeah. And as well as my Tara, who was like folk rock. Yeah. And those genres on paper just shouldn't go together for a lot of people. But the energy that carried through the show that night was magnificent. Um, you know, you have Dublin, this like genre whiplash of going back from one to another and it didn't phase anyone. 
Yeah. If anything, people were more there for it because it's like you get a kind of cabaret variety act like that. Um, yeah, and it's incredible to see people coming into shows with more open expectations, um, especially to seeing you know uh, bills full of just local artists sell out. Um, there's definitely some people that uh, that have a lot of local draw, such as you know Hillsboro, Mytara, Neighborly, uh, Nilu, as well as many others. And then there's other ones who, you know, might be really well known to like the student uh, population. Um, there was like the first show that we organized last week for CFUV's funding drive. Uh, it was the kickoff show at Upstairs Cabaret. And that one featured um, some incredible bands that I'm fortunate to know these bands through the radio station. But if I wasn't part of the radio station, I wouldn't have been in touch with them. And just getting to put this bill together of all these, you know, uh, bands that sounded really well together. Um, I was really excited about it too because again, it's that it's that idea and that uh, that means of exposing people to music. I know they're gonna like, but they just haven't found themselves yet. Yeah. So like with that show, we had four bands that honestly I think are all we're gonna see their name around a lot. Um, opening the show was Sweet Delirium, who is incredible. I first met them when they came on for the Basin Closet sessions. Um, just a really smooth mix of R&B and shoegaze mm. um, and just uh, just phenomenal vocals from Irene who leads that band. Um, and then we also had another band, Sophia Miller, and uh, she just released an EP, sorry, not an EP, uh, released a full-length album last month in February yeah. called Prologue. And I have been listening to that almost religiously. I've got the CD in my car and I've probably played it at least 20 or 30 times and we'll probably get another 20 plays before I swap it out. Yeah, well you're not alone because uh, mm -hmm. Sophia's record has been doing one of the best on those CFPB yeah. charts that you mentioned earlier, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. She was sitting at the top of the charts for a while there. Um, yeah, just an incredible local artist and through CFPB I just get to keep staying in touch with what's happening, what's coming out, all these incredible things. And it's always really nice to see how many people at the station are supporting those local acts because if it wasn't for the volunteers spinning music on the station, those artists wouldn't be getting to the top like that. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it's the 40th anniversary. Um, it, it's the fundraiser kind of funding drive for the month and everything. Uh, what, what do you kind of see when you look back mm -hmm. at the history of CFUV? Um, and what do you see kind of as the future of mm -hmm. the station being which which is kind of you know doing radio is mm -hmm. doing syndication mm -hmm. uh, is helping people put together podcasts mm -hmm. you know kind of what um what do you look back on as someone who who is there now and what do you uh expect in the future if, mm -hmm. for you continuing to be there and for you know just what campus radio means in mm -hmm. five years in ten years yeah absolutely um looking back on it um, you know, the past of the radio station is a bit of an, an enigma to me. Like, I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, and that's something I want to be more intentional about is learning more about the, uh, learning more about the station from different folks that have been around because, you know, the intergenerational nature of CUPV is one of the incredible things about it. You know, you have Jim Martins who hosts Blues in the Morning. Um, you know, he's been doing that for at least 15 years. Yeah. He's, he's, if there's anyone that's got some institutional knowledge, it's him among Troy and a lot of the other, you know, seasoned veterans of CFUV. Um, but, you know, looking back on it, like what we have for CFUV now and the progressive values and getting to hear the, you know, kind of the unfiltered voices of what, uh, you know, people are thinking right now. That all comes from where it started too, which was being, you know, by and for the community. Um, I believe when they started broadcasting, it's uh, the signal reached, I think, uh, a little bit out into Washington as well too, but mainly served the kind of, you know, Southern Island, more immediate area around Victoria. So as our voice has kind of grown beyond that too, it just allows us having more audience to hear our voices, to hear our stories but also more people to feed into CFUV mm -hmm. because when it feels like something that is actually attainable, then people are more willing to see it as less of a barrier. Yeah, I think I, um, uh, a couple years ago actually, I interviewed mm -hmm. Troy and a few others about kind of the uh, success of, of campus radio as kind of a success story within Canadian media as a whole because mm -hmm. Obviously, there are a lot of trials and tribulations in the, the media industry, mm -hmm. um, but the, um, the community integration and I think the funding model where it's mm -hmm. partly grants, it's partly 
advertising and partnerships. It's partly mm -hmm. the levy from the campus. Uh, it's partly donations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, really has proven itself a more resilient model mm -hmm. than a lot of others. Um, but something that I heard when I was talking to Troy and to others at that time was that um, there was really a point where CFUV took off. Mm -hmm. um, CJSW in Calgary was even more the forerunner yeah. of this model, but where they found ways to, uh, something kind of clicked. Mm -hmm. where it wasn't, it used to be, if you donate to the sta station, come and pick a CD. Yeah. Um, which is, is great. The, the station was kind of a purveyor of music. It was mm -hmm. your, your hub for music back in, say, the 90s. Um, but they came to find that what got people more excited wasn't saving your 10 bucks at what would have been HMV at the time. Yeah. It was feeling a part of that community, as you talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And so it really shifted more towards this, like, the merch and the tote mm -hmm. bags and the kind of different things to to feel a part of the community mm -hmm. and to show you're a part of the community and um, the volunteer base where people mm -hmm. were kind of getting this platform for free to get to learn and to try and, mm -hmm. and develop their abilities and, and put some of their their um, music they like out there yeah um, became a way that um, that community just grew yeah because now you had oh I'm, I'm calling in I'm donating my niece mm -hmm. does a show on CFUV and I want to support that. Mm -hmm. Or I, I met someone at this show and they had helped put it together and I really want to support. And so it mm -hmm. became a, a, a point of pride Absolutely. for people who were even peripherally kind of connected mm -hmm. to it to come together and say, we're happy that this exists. We're excited that this exists. Yeah. Um, is that something that you've been getting in this kind of week or two that it's been of the fundraiser? Mm -hmm. What's been your experience? of kind of, yeah, going out into the community, asking, hey, can you support us? And mm -hmm. seeing many of them say yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's been it's been a really big thing for the station. Um, like you're saying, just the merchandise being part of it alone. You know, whenever I, you know, I work at a cafe, I have my CFUV mug that I got when I started volunteering for them. Whenever someone recognizes that, it's a conversation right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, when people see my tote bag, my sweater from, you know, funding drives over the past eight years that I've been in Victoria, it always sparks a conversation when they recognize it's it like you said it's a point of pride um, and you know having been around for 40 years there's people that started at the radio station when it started as a radio station that mm -hmm. are still here in yeah. living memory too so it's an incredible thing to see that as a point of pride that has grown but the people that are directly involved and people that are affiliated just becomes more and more expansive um, and with more and more media being disaggregated across so many different, you know, social mm -hmm. media, so many different networks and channels and whatnot, I think it's really important to have those spaces that are, you know, those community hubs that people take a, a point of pride in. And yeah, there's just been a lot of great things that have happened at the station that I'm, I'm really supportive of and I'm really looking forward to. And sorry, remind me again, what was the question? I, I think you answered it, just your experience of seeing people come together and, yeah. and show that support, show mm -hmm. that love, show those different, uh, that vast web of community mm -hmm. connections that, yeah. that there has come to be over these mm -hmm. four decades now going into five. Yeah, I guess one more point on that as well. Um, yeah, a big, a big reason that we are uh, putting together some of these live show events to promote and support CFUV's funding drive is to get that more tangible interactions with the community mm. to you know physically be able to see them in the space together like when we put that first show on last week i was so elated that the community could be there in the space together you know whether they knew about cfuv and were there to support cfuv whether they knew the bands or whether they just wanted to be out and socialize or whatever at the end of the day it brought them closer to the cfuv community and getting to, yeah, again, getting to share that time and space is really invaluable to me and is a big reason of why I got involved with CFUV, why CFUV enabled me and supported me in getting to put live music and events on, uh, both my own and the ones that I've been organizing for the station. Um, but yeah, just uh, I think further to the station, just building congruence within the community, kind of building upwards and outwards has been a big thing that CFUV has been a part of in Victoria. Yeah, I think that, as you say, it's, it's a chance for those, um, that imagined community that people have when mm -hmm. they get to hear music they like and, and the type of community that they're interested in 
um, from wherever they are in the region, mm -hmm. um, that imagined community becomes a real community yeah. when you have these instances where you can bring people together for a show to hear the same music they've been listening to mm -hmm. uh, in a live setting and with the other listeners that they've been mm -hmm. um, listening together with without yeah. fully knowing it. Um, and so we actually have to let you get to the next show um, that's coming on tonight um, yes. downtown. But I'm really appreciative that you took the time for us mm -hmm. today. Uh, this is Kobe. The station, of course, is CFUV. You can also look out for Eventide, the shows mm -hmm. in the summer. Um, and thank you for being a part of yeah. Island Sounds and Stories. And we'll see you next time. Awesome. Here we go. Thank you. Yeah, ran a little long with you there. Oh, that's all right. I'm glad I had the time for it. <laughs>